Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Rosenkopf, Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship at the Wharton School, and it's great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us virtually at Scale School for today's To Change, Pivot, or Persist, hosted by Venture Lab and Lifelong Learning. Please take a moment to share in the chat where you're tuning in from and add your affiliation or company name to your Zoom title. Today's program will be led by Assistant Professor Jax Kirtley, and Jax's research interest in the areas of technology entrepreneurship, early stage strategy evolution, and technological innovation will frame today's discussion. Jax will be joined by two esteemed panelists, Jeff Fleur, Engineering 96 and Wharton 96, who's the general partner at Craft Ventures, and Andy Friedman, Wharton grad 95, who's the managing partner at Pin High Capital and founder and former CEO of Skinny Pop Popcorn. So how will today's program work? Jax's discussion with our panelists will be followed by audience Q&A. And if you have a question, don't hesitate to submit it in the Zoom chat throughout the event. After Q&A, we'll wrap up the program. And as a quick reminder, if you select speaker view in the right-hand corner of your Zoom screen, you'll have an optimal viewing experience. And now I'll turn the program over to Jax. Thank you so much, Lori. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm loving seeing all the places that you're coming, you're joining us from. And um, I will say, I'm, and I'm gonna say this, this again, thank you, Jeff and Andy for joining us today and helping us out with this conversation. When the Scale School team approached me about this session today, and talking about pivots. My first reaction was, yes, absolutely, let's have this conversation. And my second reaction was a little more, oh boy, and a little more reserved. And the reason is the word pivot, it's a buzzword. It has attained that status. And like all buzzwords, it's used a lot and it's not always used the same way. There are a lot of ways that we use this word that are just downright different definitions. The word pivot entered the entrepreneurial lexicon with the lean startup movement and um, writings by Eric Ries and Steve Blank. And it became ubiquitous in entrepreneurship. You hear entrepreneurs talk about pivots, you hear investors, practitioners, this is a big word. And we use it a lot of different ways. It's actually spread out. You'll now see the word pivot used beyond entrepreneurship quite a bit, not because it wasn't always in the English language, but because we're using it, we're talking about pivots as a kind of change. There are two main definitions of pivot in the context of entrepreneurship. The first is a strategic pivot. Now, a strategic pivot is when the firm changes in a way that reorients the entire firm's strategic direction. And this is done through reallocation and restructuring of activities, resources, attention. This is when you go from well, initially we were making a online video game and now we make a communication tool for companies and individuals. This kind of massive shift in direction and who we are. And most of the time, when you and I sit, talk about an entrepreneurial pivot, we're probably talking about the strategic direction, the strategic redirection, the strategic pivot. But very often entrepreneurs are talking about an experimentation pivot. And this is what Lean Startup was originally presenting, this scientific method of entrepreneurship. And this is a change in product, business model, target market, or other kind of piece of the strategy that comes after learning, after hypothesis testing and experimentation. And this is, this is the kind of pivot we talk about in a classroom in, an, in entrepreneurship. This is where we're trying to get and help entrepreneurs learn about what they're doing and improve and move out of the hypothesis that are either unconscious or hopefully conscious and improve their strategies. This is the scientific method of entrepreneurship that Lean Startup was all about. So why does it matter that we talk about pivots? What either definition? Fundamentally, entrepreneurial firms and entrepreneurial strategy is incomplete. When entrepreneurs have these great ideas to start new firms, novel innovations, great ideas to do something that isn't out there yet, they don't start with a fully formed operational 
financing product feature list, it's an incomplete idea and it's full of uncertainty because there are things we don't know until we get started and we start enacting and exploiting these ideas, these opportunities that entrepreneurs have. We don't have all the details worked out from the beginning. And what that means is as those details get worked out, their pieces will be added, subtracted, adapted, altered, learned, and experimented upon. Those changes, those are sometimes filling in the blanks and sometimes they really are changes. And they're all decisions that are made by entrepreneurs because of what the entrepreneur wants to achieve or maybe not just the entrepreneur, but the firm, the team, the stakeholders, what they want to achieve with this firm, with this endeavor. One of the things we know about entrepreneurs is, and buzzwords as well, is that there's a lot of hero stories when it comes to entrepreneurship. We love our heroes of entrepreneurship who started something small and persisted, who continued through multiple, ba um, multiple almost failures or multiple um, bankruptcies and persevered because they believed and came out the other side a winner. We also really love our pivoting entrepreneur heroes who started doing one thing, realized that they were something else they could do and achieved unicorn status and rode off into the sunset on that unicorn. We love those hero stories. Hero stories tend to also come with myths. And what I wanna focus in our discussion today and where Andy and Jeff are gonna help me from their stories and their experiences is to talk about three myths of entrepreneurial pivots. The first myth is that pivots happen in a single conscious redirection, like a basketball player pivoting and turning on one foot and sending the ball in a different direction. In actuality, most entrepreneurial pivots are a slower process. They are developed out of a series of decisions that, and experiments that happen over time. Sometimes the entrepreneurs don't even realize they're in the process of completely redirecting their firm until they come out the other side and realize they're in a different place. From the outside, from the stories we tell, this looks like a decision to shift like a basketball player. From the inside, they're often much more organic stories about improving the business, improving the product, and improving your chances of success for your goals as entrepreneurs. Now, Andy Friedman has, I think, a very, a very strong example of this story in what started as Well Street Popcorn, a retail decadent food business, and has become Skinny Pop, which I enjoyed earlier today, had some of that which is a very different business story. Andy, can you tell us about your, the series of decisions over time that brought Well Street to Skinny Pop? Sure, can you hear me by the way? Yes. Okay, good. So this, I guess we're going back to about 2007. Um, we had started a, a retail popcorn business and we had developed a very delicious decadent popcorn really focused on caramel corn and cheese corn. And we were going to open up a bunch of stores and take over the East Coast with these popcorn shops. And what we were finding is that um, we were really fighting an uphill battle because the world was changing towards better for you snacking and health and wellness and things of that nature. And here we were a new entrant to the snacking world. And we were trying to sell a very decadent product. And we were finding that consumers were coming into our stores on a daily basis. And they were saying, best popcorn I've ever had, better than Garrett's, which is an iconic brand in the Chicagoland area. And then giving us a see you, next, see you next month. And we thought to ourselves, you know, that's a nice compliment. And yet, even if Starbucks was getting that same compliment and that was, and that was their business model, it wouldn't be what it is today if their best customers were coming in once a month. So we knew we needed to come up with some kind of a, some kind of a, a turn. I didn't, we didn't really think about the concept of pivoting, but we knew we needed to get away, figure out a way to get the consumers to come into our stores more frequently. So we started experimenting with different kernels and better for you seasonings and oils and things of that nature. And when we ultimately came up with what is now Skinny Pop, we knew that we had something unique, different, um, and something that you could snack on on a daily basis. And we also knew that we couldn't sell that in our retail stores because that was going to submarine that whole business altogether because if we're out there pushing this 
light product at 39 calories a, a cup, people will start asking us questions that have absolutely horrifying answers. Like how many calories are in a cup of your caramel corn or how much fat is in a cup of your cheese corn? And so we knew we needed to figure out a way to get that product into a bag onto a grocery store shelf and figure out a way to make it happen. Um, again, by the way, I came to this with, I, I was a, I'm a former investment banker. I was a finance major at Wharton. I had no food experience. I barely knew what CPG stood for. And I all of a sudden was thrust in, into this arena. So here we were, my partner and I sat in a little office which was in the back of the kitchen of one of our retail stores. And we came up with the, you know, a bunch of names. Fortunately, one of the names was Skinny Pop. And we said, listen, let's figure out a way to just make this happen. So I guess armed with our laptops, access to Google, our personal networks, we set out to launch this new brand, this Skinny Pop popcorn brand. And you know, this was again, early, so we ran this business, the Wall Street Popcorn, 2008, 9, and 10. Um, it, for the record, or just so you know, it literally, it was a nice little business. It had an insatiable need for capital. It was growing, it was profitable, but it literally, my only compensation for three years, all of 2008, 9, and 10, was that it paid for my cell phone bill. And that was it. But, I, and I was, you know, I had young kids and trying to raise a family and, I had all kinds of needs to, you know, beyond just having my cell phone bill paid for. So in any case, here we were, this was early 2010 when we had this moment where we've, we've got to change this business model. And when we came up with Skinny Pop, we, you know, it took about, you know, six months from the time that we had this idea until the first bags came in and we were on, you know, this was, we, you know, we sold our first bag in August of 2010. Uh, fun fact, we hired our first employee in September of 2012. So we went two years, just the two of us trying to make this happen. And fortunately, um, it, you know, we, the first couple uh, uh, retailers that carried our product called us the next day saying, you know, that skinny pop popcorn that you, that you brought over, uh, we really like it it's selling well, we would like some more. And so I knew we were onto something, but never in a million years that I think it was going to turn into what it had turned into. I didn't even dream of it. So it wasn't a, a conscious pivot. It was more of a, you know, we were trying to, you know, we went from wrong product at the wrong time to we were trying to make the right product at the right time. And so when we all, when we came up with Skinny Pop, we went from, you know, wind in our face to wind at our back for the first time. And the business really, um, you know, ramped up very, very quickly. I mean, initially the first four or five months we were making it ourselves, popping, packing, sealing, shipping out of the small, uh, it was our largest kitchen, but it was a small kitchen. And we, we literally could only make 50 cases in a day, 12 bags a case, 600 bags. And we were stacking the cases up to the ceilings and um, I could go on and on and on. But we eventually, we... <laughs> You know, we found we were fortunate enough to find a distributor that would come to our store five days a week and pick up the, the cases. And we had a very unique situation because we had this incredible pull uh, of our product. Our distributor knew that they, we knew that we could, as many cases of popcorn, of skinny pop that we could make in a day, we knew the distributor was going to buy. They were pulling it from us. More important than that, the distributor was getting pressure from the retailers because they want, they were pulling it because they needed to get as hold of as much skinny pop as they could. And most important than that, and much more important than that was that the, the, the consumers were pulling from the retailers, who were pulling from the distributors, who were pulling from us. We had a problem, we had a giant bottleneck. We needed to figure out a way to produce as much skinny pop as possible. Anyway, that's that's kind of my-, my That's my a good problem to have. Yeah, it, it was a great problem to have. But it so was a problem by the way, and it was real. And it led to many, many sleepless nights. So you mentioned you went from wrong product, wrong time to right product, right time. Yeah. But Well Street Popcorns didn't stop. No. You, uh, you sold that business to one of your store managers, if I remember yep. correctly. Correct. So when we think about that turn of the basketball player, yep. we, we think the old, ver the old variants, the old strategies left behind, but it's not always. 
It's correct. I mean, the Wall Street popcorn is still in existence today. It's making a, you know, a nice living for the guy that owns it. It was actually my business partner's cousin who was manager of one of our stores by day and bartender by night to make ends meet. And when we transitioned this business to him, it changed his life for the better. But for us, what we got was our time. And we were able to focus exclusively on Skinny Pop, this business that was blowing up. So that was a really important transition. And that happened January 1st, 2011. I love how clear you are about the dates of your- Oh, I, I got your... it all, yeah. <laughs> so that, I mean, I think that Andy Skinny Pop's story is a great example of this. This first myth is wrong. We don't take a complete change. We don't take it in a single move. It's a series of decisions and it's something that happens over time, which, but the fact that Wall Street popcorn is still around brings us to our second myth. And our second myth is that strategic pivots happen because the entrepreneur's founding idea was flawed or wrong, and that this change will save the firm. In actuality, most strategic pivots happen because the firm is following and exploring a bet potentially better opportunity or something that's a better fit to what the entrepreneurs have learned and what they want to be created. So I'm gonna bring the spotlight to Jeff because Jeff's um, first startup, which started out as Liquid Seeds, and I will say opened during, you, you, you guys started as the dot-com bubble was bursting, was blowing up, not the most, not the most positive signal to, to start a, an online company with, but your the transition and the pivot from Liquid Suites to StubHub, which is the name that our, our listeners will recognize quite a bit more, that was about following learning, not because the original idea was flawed, but because the potential and what you guys were could do with the idea you had. Tell us that story. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, th thank you for having me today, Jax. We're really excited to uh, to be here. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we started um, uh, what became StubHub, what was originally called Liquid Seats in um, in March of 2000. And uh, for those for those of you who who might remember, March of 2000 was um, the month before the dot com bubble burst. So, you know, I was um, I, I, I was I had graduated uh, Penn and. 1996, and for um, you know, for the four years between when I graduated Penn and when I started StubHub, uh, you know, this was sort of the Internet 1.0, the, the rise of some of these exciting companies in the late 90s, like Yahoo and Amazon and eBay and Netscape and AOL. And so, um, you know, I was I, I was at Stanford Business School at the time when I started StubHub, and um, yeah, we originally. So, so we, we incorporated the company in March of 2000, April of 2000, the kind of the bubble burst, um, the, the public companies in the internet space lost, you know, 80 to 90% of their value over the course of the next, you know, mo most of that value was lost in a fairly short six or eight week period, but it continued a downward trend for another couple of years after that. And, um, and, and we were, we had not yet launched anything. Uh, we, we had incorporated, we had started um, recruiting some, some people to be on our team. Uh, and we were, you, you know, we, we, we wanted to create a more efficient marketplace for tickets, for event tickets, for sporting events and concerts. We knew that there was a fundamental need in, um, in, in, uh, that, that people had when they, when they purchased tickets for, for events. You, you have this dynamic of season tickets, people buy you know, a season ticket package for baseball, you get 81 games in a season ticket package and people don't go to 81 games in a season. So there's all these tickets that are left over for resale and people deal with ticket brokers or ticket scalpers to resell their extra tickets. And then similarly, when you have a sold out event, um, it could be a concert or a, or a you know, a post -season sporting event like a, a World Series when um, you know, it's often very hard to get tickets because the tickets are all sold out and you can go through ticket brokers to buy tickets. So we knew that there was this sort of need and, um, and there was a lot of, um, th there were a lot of inefficiencies with ticket brokers and ticket scalpers. And, and it was starting to move on the internet with eBay and Craigslist, but those platforms were, um, were leaving a lot on the table in terms of trust and safety. So 
we originally set out to solve that problem, but um, what we quickly realized as we started to try to raise capital in the kind of middle of 2000 was that um, any business that was a kind of consumer internet business was um, very difficult to raise capital for. So the, the, the kind of conventional wisdom at the time was um, the internet bubble had burst and there were these kind of B2B businesses and B2C businesses. And the, the B2C businesses, which were all about aggregating eyeballs, trying to get as many eyeballs as you could get, um, it wasn't, people weren't as focused on revenue um, or sort of typical financial metrics. They were more focused on, you know, kind of users and what they called eyeballs. When, when the bubble burst in April of 2000, that whole, um, th th that whole concept of, acquiring eyeballs became uh, kind of th thrown out, thrown out the window. And people said, okay, that, that, that was fun while it lasted, but this internet thing is going to, is, is, is going nowhere. The internet is not going to happen. And, and in particular, the B2C businesses were the ones that were most um, kind of, uh, that were frowned upon the most. And, but, but people thought these B2B businesses might actually work. So, so what, so we were kind of influenced by that thinking and so instead of launching a consumer destination site, we decided we would approach this resale ticket resale problem by partnering with other uh, other existing um, websites. And so we we had this kind of B two B strategy initially, which is why the name of the company was Liquid Seats. And the B two B strategy involved partnering with media properties like AOL or Yahoo. Um, or M at the time MSN, these were th th these were like the three big media properties back in the early 2000s, and um, and we did some partnerships with folks like that um, to kind of power the ticket resale for them. So so you could go to like the uh, AOL ticket marketplace, and it was sort of powered by by Liquid Seats. Um, but we weren't really trying to build a brand. Instead, we were trying to um, siphon off traffic from their existing users. So that we didn't have to spend all this money on customer acquisition, and then we could share the revenue. We could generate transaction fees every time somebody bought or sold tickets, and we would share those transaction fees. The revenue from those transaction fees we would share with the partner, with the media partner. And so, instead of you know spewing a ton of money on cu customer acquisition, we could we could kind of be more conservative with our cash and and build a business that way. And so that that was the. Um, that was the original, you know, stuff. What is now StubHub? What was then called Liquid Seats for, you know, for several years uh, before we pivoted to, um, you know, to more of a, a business to consumer a strategy. And I can talk more about that if, if if you'd like and what we did there. But that's sort of the high level. So you you had mentioned to me very previously that the that StubHub as a site had started as an experimentation as a way to demonstrate to your partners what could happen on their sites. And I think what's one of the things that I really love about the story of StubHub is that what was marketing to your B2B customers became your B2C company. Yep, yeah, that's right. So, so um, the when we launched Liquid Seats, we actually did have Stub. We had both names. We had Liquid Seats, which was the corporate name and the kind of primary name. We also did have StubHub, and um, we launched StubHub.com really as a way to showcase um, what the, the the software and the and how the what the software could do and how the system worked, so that when we were approaching folks like MSN we could show them um, the, the software in action and, um, and, and how the system worked. And so it was very much an afterthought and we didn't put any real resources into StubHub. And, and that was the case for years, actually, from 2000 until about 2003, we, um, we were really focused on this B2B strategy. So we were partnering with media companies. We partnered with a bunch of sports teams. We got a few of the leagues and teams to actually embrace the idea of ticket resale. There was a lot of kind of skepticism um, from, from that community because they thought that there were, there were all these kind of um, perception and stigma, stigma around um, the resale of tickets. And so that was a little bit of um, pushing a, pushing a, a boulder up a hill, but we ultimately did convert some of the folks in the, in the live event industry to, Kind of embrace this idea of reselling tickets. It was also kind of controversial because they were worried about cannibalizing their primary ticket sales. But we were partnering with all these people for the first three years, 
And we had some success doing that, but we did have this kind of destination site, StubHub, even from the earliest days. What, what led us to ultimately focus on StubHub instead of on, on this kind of B2B strategy and, and instead focus on the B2C strategy was really um, paid search. So Google AdWords and, and Yahoo had, a, had acquired actually a company called Overture, which became kind of the core of Yahoo's kind of paid search um, strategy. We started experimenting in about 2003 with, um, with paid search, with paying for keywords so that when people would go into Google and type in Yankees tickets, we could have an ad that would pop up as we're all familiar with the, the paid search model today. And, but it was very new at the time, right? So it was, um, it was just kind of co coming, uh, coming to the market. And so we started experimenting with you know, paying for these keywords and sending traffic directly to StubHub because at that point, if we were paying for the traffic, we wanted to keep 100% of the transaction fees. We, wouldn't gonna, we weren't going to send that traffic to our partner websites and then give them part of the revenue. We would just send it to this destination website that we had all along, even though it was a kind of an afterthought. And we started realizing that we could, we could acquire customers to, to, to come to StubHub and generate revenue from those transaction fees that would pay for that customer acquisition cost very quickly. And that the payback would be basically immediate. So on that very first transaction, we were more than covering the cost of getting the consumer to come and do that transaction. And so it, it quickly became clear to us that like, wow, we have a very interesting mousetrap here. We can, we can spend money on paid search. We can add a, you know, a bazillion keywords. Ultimately we had, you know, hundreds of thousands of keywords that we were bidding on. Um, and so there was, a, there was a lot of kind of, um, there was a lot of headroom to, to expand our, 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 rev, our, our, keyword, our set of keywords and thus our revenue within this. And the consumer was coming to StubHub. They were, they were learning the StubHub brand. It was a consumer that we would then have not only for that transaction, but for their second transaction and third transaction. And then they could tell their friends about StubHub. And instead of powering these kind of other B2B um, you know, marketplaces, um, we, we had our own consumer marketplace. And after doing that for about six months, maybe a year and, and seeing the growth of kind of that kind of B2, B2C strategy versus the, the B2B partnerships, um, we quickly, um, you know, pivoted the company to be completely focused on B2C. We got rid of the liquid seats name. We changed the whole name of the company to StubHub. All of the, we, we continued to do partnerships from that point forward, but the partnerships changed kind of 180 degrees in terms of what they looked like. Prior to the pivot, they were revenue share agreements, as I described. They were usually kind of either white labeled where our brand didn't exist at all, or sometimes there was like a powered by liquid seats kind of designation. Um, but they were, the, the branding was very, was, the primary branding was very clearly whoever the partner was. And, and that changed after this pivot. So we, would, we, we did a bunch of deals with sports teams and, and even some media company deals, but they were just StubHub. They were just sending traffic to StubHub. They weren't kind of branded um, with the partner's brand. So, so and we kept 100% of the revenue from these, from these transaction fees. In many cases, we paid the partner, like in the sports team examples, we paid the partner up front. So we were... The idea of a guaranteed payment when we started the company was like, it was like the worst concept we could think of, right? We never wanted to like commit to AOL. Back in the, back in the early 2000s, AOL wanted a million dollars if you ever wanted to be on the AOL homepage, that you just had to pay them a million dollars and good luck getting whatever revenue you got from that. That was something that was for us was, um, was considered the, the, the worst idea out there. But it, after we made this pivot, it actually became our preferred, uh, um, our preferred strategy because we had very good data about what these partnerships were worth. We had we we knew how much money we could make from different teams. We already had kind of a business in in different um, tickets, different different uh, geographies, and so we kind of had asymmetry of information. We knew more than the partner did, and so we would be much we were much more willing to pay you know the. Um, pay an NFL team half a million dollars a year because we knew that the deal was worth $2 million a year, you know? So, so we, we were, um, it became much more about like a sponsor. It's the same way you might see skinny pop in the outdoor, I'm sorry, in the outfield of a baseball stadium, right? Like the, 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 the Budweiser logo and Budweiser is just paying for that. 
we were just paying for the stub hub signage in the outfield and for mailers to all the season ticket holders. And we were committing those dollars up front, but keeping hundred percent of the transaction fees. So the whole kind of business shifted to this kind of B2C strategy, which is of course what we all know today as stub hub. And, um, and that ultimately, you know, was how we got there. I, I loved, you refer to it uh, once as uh, in a medium article, when you talked about this, that you wrote last year, you said that the B2C strategy won the horse race. And it is, it's not that the old way was wrong. This was a complete change. We tried them both. We, we saw what we wanted and we saw what we learned. The world had changed as well between when you started and when B2C was this bad thing and post AdWords when B2C was a, a, a really effective and I think you guys demonstrated a very effective strategy. So I wanna get to our third myth. Our third myth is that pivoting or pivoting even a, an additional time is the right thing to do. This is a myth that kind of amazes me where I talk to entrepreneurs or investors who will tell me they want the entrepreneur, they think they need to pivot. Like a pivot is something you have to do. When in actuality, sometimes the right thing to do is persist, is to keep going. And we see outsiders judge entrepreneurs uh, for their hubris and their unwillingness to change. I'm very wary of that judgment because they see things differently and they're from a, coming at it from a different side and they're the ones acting. And persistence is often the right way to, for those firms. Other times, the right thing to do isn't to change your strategy, just, but to stop and to say, this, this one isn't working, the sunk costs are gone, we need to move on. Andy, you told me when you started Wall Street that, and, you, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs have probably said a similar version of this, you were willing to do anything legal to make it work. I think a lot of entrepreneurs see themselves in that sentence. And it took a long time. You, you gave us some, some, some years and some waypoints in your story. But the change that, there was one change. And once Skinny Pop got started, you kept, you stayed on that path all the hard knocks um, endured and all the struggles and all the sleepless nights. How did you know, or was it even a conscious decision to keep going on that path versus take some other routes from skinny pop forward? Sure. So we, you know, ran Wall Street Popcorn for three years. We were um, completely, you know, uh, dedicated to making this work and consumers were loving it. And yet we just weren't getting the feeling that we were getting ahead. We were always chasing and never catching up. And when we launched Skinny Pop, there was this uh, kind of this perception from the consumer. They wanted it. It was a, it was a really um, kind, of, kind of a fun product. Consumers loved it. Um, we were you know, it was a, a product that you could eat on a daily basis. And um, we knew that we were onto something. Never had that feeling with Wells Free Popcorn. We knew that it was a decadent treat and it was going to be a tough road ahead of us. With Skinny Pop, we just hit the ground running and it took off right away. Um, so it wasn't easy, but it was accepted by the consumer. It was understood by the consumer. You know, we were really kind of checked all the boxes of what was, what the consumers were looking for, allergen free, lighter, fresh, all that stuff. And um, it was just very obvious to us that that was the path that had the pot of gold at the end of it. I love how you use all of these phrases um, onto something, checked all the boxes. The buzzword that, that entrepreneurship tends to use is product market fit. I yeah. mean, in many ways, that's you, you, that pull from the audience, that pull from the customer, that, that is sort of the, that golden spot of product market fit you, where you know the customer is really demands it, wants it, favors it. Yep. And so when you feel that, that was the feeling that said, we're on the right track and we're staying here. Absolutely. And I might have used that phrase had I been a marketing guy, but I was a finance guy and that phrase was not too obvious to me. See, if you'd taken my class, you totally would have been using this one. We, we, we drill that into our students pretty well these days. Fair point. Uh, <laughs> now, 
Jeff, with your second startup, which was Spreecast, social video um, website and apps, you did change a few times. And the what um, what I found really fascinating about the products that Spreecast did is they all had a period of strong viral success and then a plateau or a falling off. And so that plateau kind of became an instigation for trying something else, trying something in addition or trying something different. When did you, when you think about that example, and I think you're gonna, of course, need to tell the crew a little more about what I'm talking about from your, um, how did you think about when to start a new product? And then once you got to the point where you said, okay, we've done this a few times, we're not pivoting again, we're stopping. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, I think this is one of the toughest things actually about being an entrepreneur and, and also, you know, an investor or someone who's advising entrepreneurs. It, 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 and you, you kind of touched on this earlier. It's like the thing, like, I think in order to succeed in, um, I think in order to succeed in, in, in a startup and in, in business, you have to have a lot of persistence. Um, and, you know, and I think the stories of, you know, Andy's story with Skinny Pop and, um, and the story of, of pivoting StubHub from more of a B2B partnership driven model to a B2C model, um, you know, are good examples where things worked out really well. But, um, you know, so, so you, but you, you, but even in those examples, when things work out really well, there's, there's a lot of persistence and being an entrepreneur is, um, you know, it's hard um, and grueling. And so you, so you need persistence to kind of do well, even when things are going well. Um, and, and usually they don't go well, the, you know, right out of the box. Um, usually they, they require some um, pivoting or iteration or learning or test, test and learn, test and learn. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are, you know, there, there, you know, and, you know, so, so it's, it, this idea of needing to be persistent and then also sometimes needing to pivot almost are diametrically opposed. Like, how do you, if, if, if you're persistent, doesn't that mean you stick to something for a long time? But if you're pivoting, you're, you're not, you're moving to the next thing. So how do you balance those two things? How do you make a decision when it's a good time to pivot? Or if you should just, you know, keep kind of keep at the, the thing you're, you're, you started with. Um, and I think that's really hard to, to decide. And I think it's a, a ultimately a judgment call. Um, and to some extent, I think a gut feeling, um, right? Like Andy described how with Wall Street, it was kind of always it felt like it was headwinds, right? And then suddenly there were tailwinds. So I think, you know, if you get if, if you have um, a gut feeling that it's just not going great, then I think it's probably a good time to try something new um, or at least iterate on what you're doing. So what, so Spreecast was, um, we launched Spreecast, I want to say it was in 2011. I think it was um, kind of, you know, Q3 or something like that of 2011. And it was basically... Um, it was a social video platform. So it was, you know, it was kind of like Zoom. Um, it was live video, people interacting, but it was, it was more public forum conversations. You could, you could do private, um, you could do private sessions kind of like this, but you could also do public sessions that would be listed on our, it was all browser based. So it was all in a web browser, um, unlike Zoom, which is an app, a desktop application that you have to install. Um, but, but, but so it was sort of like Facebook meets Zoom. Um, other people have described it now that we have Clubhouse, which was sort of a phenomenon from, you know, a year ago or nine months ago. I think the buzz on Clubhouse has died down somewhat, but people think about Clubhouse, which is these kind of public audio based open forum conversations. Spreecast was kind of like Clubhouse, but with video. So that was the first product we launched. And, um, and the theory that I had and the reason why we launched this product was that, you know, social media, and this is, this has become even more of a narrative, I think since then, but there was, there was, there were some issues with um, social media that I felt like, but even back then when we started Spreecast, which was, there was sort of this kind of facade people were putting up on social media. They were kind of showing, um, you know, pictures on Instagram or their posts on Facebook that made it look like they, they had this perfect life and they were happy. It, it was, there was a lack of authenticity in some of the social media that um, the, the social media products and, and um, platforms that existed at the time. And I felt like bringing people together to actually interact face-to-face -face instead of just 
post something up in a sort of more um, asynchronous way would 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 it would enhance authenticity and actually enhance human relationships. And so that was sort of the idea and the technology of being able to actually enable face to face video based conversations. Um, you know, was kind of was was at the beginning of 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 its kind of. I mean, Skype had been around for a long time, but Skype was more like one to one kind of private conversations. The ability to do this with multiple people kind of in a web browser was was really at the infancy right around the time that we started Spreecast. So the idea was to like leverage that that new technical capability and the ideas of social media, um, you know, to build on top of Facebook and Twitter so that people could share on Facebook and Twitter and kind of bring friends together in sort of a live video experience and uh, and meet new people as well as their, you know, as well as interact with their existing contacts. So that was the idea behind Spreecast. We launched it in like roughly, I think, Q3 of 2011. It, it had pretty good success in the first 18 months, as you pointed out. We launched, we did, you know, we had bloggers using it and podcasters, and then there were just kind of social, you know, um, use, use use cases with people using it to meet new friends or or using it with their existing friends. The Wall Street Journal was using Spree, uh, Spreecast. ESPN was using Spreecast. We had embedded, so we had we had Spreecast.com, but we also had like an embedded player where you can embed it onto another website. So you see like the YouTube embedded player all over the internet, right? You had like a Spreecast player. So the Wall Street Journal could put like a Spreecast player on their website. And then their journalists could host like live, you know, interviews with, you know, a CEO of a company or something. And ESPN used to use it a lot to talk about sports. And, and then people in the audience who were watching, just like all of you who are watching, you know, watching our, our, our panel today could request to join on camera. They could raise their hand. There would be producer controls where the person who created the spreecast would be able to allow people to join on camera um, or, or not um, and kick people off camera if they were doing something inappropriate. So anyway, that was the product and the and the idea, and it had some early success. And and like most social products, the idea was it was going to be a free product until we had a big enough user base. At which point, we would figure out how to monetize it through ads or through some other, um, you know, either subscriptions or ads or pre premium features. And we started we started getting some good usage, but um, after about like twelve or eighteen months, the the um, you know the the growth. We had a couple issues, but but ultimately, like the growth wasn't as strong. Um, we we started to realize we kind of needed to figure out how to monetize it. Um, we started to figure. We tried to monetize it by putting some video ads into the player, so that before, like, if you would join a live spreecast, you might see a thirty second video ad before you'd see the live spreecast. Or if you were because everything was recorded, so you could also watch all the recordings or the archives, what we call the archives. Um, and those could also have video ads in them, but but there, but the, the revenue from the video ads wasn't material enough. Then we tried to figure out how to monetize it with like freemium, what we call freemium. So there was still a free version, but there were certain features that you had to pay for, um, which really was aimed at not the kind of viewers, but more the creators to be paying for premium features. There wasn't that that wasn't enough revenue either, and that even slowed down our growth even more because once you start charging for a product, it slows down its growth. So we kind of we we kind of decided after a couple of years that um, you know that it wasn't it, it wasn't going to get to the point that we wanted it to get to. The the other types of users we had we had a bunch of celebrities on Spreecast, so like One Direction, Britney Spears, Miley Cyrus, they all came on Spreecast, engaged with their fans. But it wasn't it wasn't big enough like to, to get to kind of you know a a, a kind of a scaled um, business and so we we started building another we started building other products with the team that we had we didn't shut down Spreecast yet but we kind of took a lot of resources off of it and took engineering and product resources and started building other products we built a product called Room we all the, the, we built two other products um, they were both based on live video so this idea of I think pivot's a good word because pivot suggests, as you brought up the basketball example, it's right. Like one foot stays still, the other foot can pivot. So the idea of pivot is like something's still and something else is moving. Right. So I think a lot of times, not all the time, but I think a lot of times these pivots do have some thread of, you know, some common thread with the original, with the last idea. And that was true with us. We were using a lot of the same types of technology, live video and kind of the idea of people interacting with live video. Um, with our second and third product. The second product was called Room. The third product was called Flurry, um, um, which I can describe also, but they were they were kind of different iterations of products that also kind of had a similar, actually similar sort of 
dynamics, right? Um, Room was growing really well, but was even harder to monetize. Um, Flurry was all mobile based and kind of focused on teenagers and kind of these like teenage influencers. That grew for a while really well. It had a much better monetization strategy built in from the get go, but then it stopped growing. Um, and one of the things that was also happening in the background was there was, we were early in 2011 with live video, but live video became a very hot space for a little while, right? You had Meerkat, which then, and then they, so Meerkat was this like mobile live streaming app. And then Periscope was another mobile live streaming app. Meerkat went viral. Everybody thought it was going to be the next big thing. And then Periscope got acquired by Twitter before they even launched. And then they launched and everybody was like, okay, now Periscope's going to kill Meerkat. And then like six months or a year after that, like they both sort of died down. No one was using Meerkat or Periscope anymore. And then Facebook Live launched. And it was like, okay, Facebook Live's going to take over the world. And then Facebook Live was advertising all over school buses. I mean, um, all over so, buses yeah, in the cities. I want to, I want to, because I just noticed somebody yeah. in, the, in the chat asked a question that's very similar to this. When we look for, and this is a very Wharton kind of question, when we look for measures that we're thinking about, you've mentioned monetization measures. We weren't getting enough money. We weren't getting, we were getting sort of changes or not sufficient amounts of traffic. Was, are there measures that you think of? Because let's face it, Wharton, want, want, Wharton wants to know what, da what data do we look to? Were there measures that you looked for? Was, is it, um, there's a monetization threshold or there's, a, there's an audience kind of threshold or is it depend on the strategy? Is, it, is, there, a, is there a takeaway that, I, that our audience can say, These are the this is the monetization measure or the audience measure, customer measure that we should look for and think, and, put into our consideration set, or is it really dependent? And I'm gonna add, throw this at both of you for that question. And I, I'm gonna also say, those of you in the audience who wanna throw some more questions down, we have some time for Q&A now. I wanna get you to start throwing some questions in there. Is there a, a measure? Well, where... I think, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think if you're like, if you wanna be like venture backed and, and, and um, you, you need either like, material revenue that's at least doubling every year in the early years, right? Like, and you need to get to like a million in revenue and then that needs to double and then double. Um, and ideally it's more than doubling in the first few years. Um, like, like there's this idea of triple, triple, double, 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 or was it triple, triple, double, 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 I think. Um, but you, you know, you want to be like growing fast revenue um, that, you know, is scaling past a million um, and then still growing fast or um you need to have like hyper growth in your user base if you're kind of more of the, of the social flavor where you're, you're not as focused on revenue yet, then you need to just have like hyper growth in your user base, which means, you know, even faster growth in users than I just described on the revenue side. So if you don't have one of those two things like con consistently and sustained over, you know, years, then you, then you, then you don't have something that's like going to be really valuable. And I think a, a key to that is that that's for the VC investor style entrepreneurial firm right. that needs to have those kinds of growth measures. Andy, would you, do you think there are other measures that our audience should think about looking at? Yeah, I mean, Jeff is spot on as far as tech and you know, sophisticated VC backed companies. Um, but in the, you know, the little world of snacking, you look at a couple different things. Um, you're looking at revenue, profitability, some of these super basic terms. And in the case of Wells Street Popcorn, the revenue and the profitability wasn't getting where we needed to be, where we needed it to be quickly enough. And in, when we kept that one foot planted and we were moving the other foot around and we grabbed onto Skinny Pop, those numbers changed dramatically. So the revenue was, you know, these were exponential growth that we experienced and in both revenue and profitability. And we just didn't see anything like that when we had the retail stores. So the fact that this is, uh, that Jeff mentioned these as measures that VCs look for actually yeah. connects to another question that I see in the chat, which is related to how your investors played, what role they played in these kinds of choices. Um, so Andy, when you when when Wall Street turned to Skinny Pop, you didn't really have investors. Yeah. You, it was just you and your co-founder at that yeah. point. But you've yeah. been working with firms um, and, and become an investor yourself. You both yeah. have. As investors, how do you 
how do you play a role? Because we hear, and I saw another comment in the chat where people are hearing from investors, you should pivot. How do you see investors playing a role in this choice and in this process? Well, I, 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 listen, I think pivoting for pivoting's sake is not a great strategic move. I think that if there is a reason to explore pivoting, it's, it's a good place to spend some time and resources. Um, but I think um, a, an advisor or an investor, their, their role is to, I would say, point out directions that you should be exploring if, the business, if, the, if your base business is not taking off like everyone wants it to and act as a sounding board and act as someone that's not really, because once you're in one of these startups, it becomes all encompassing and you, you sometimes have a hard time seeing outside of, outside of your business. And so the advisor's role, I think really is to step back and ask some probing questions. Have you thought about this or that? And tell me why you're thinking about doing the other thing. And and so I think it's super important for them to be a stable force, not an erratic person peppering the entrepreneur with all kinds of questions and pressure. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, look, the, the, the investor, when the investor invests, the, the ideal scenario is that the, the team that you back, the idea that you back, the, the business that you back works, you know, swimmingly and everything goes as planned and the thing goes up and to the right and you don't have to pivot, right? That's, that is the, um, the goal, right? And, and um, you know, I think as you said earlier, it turns into a unicorn and you ride off into the sunset. I think, um, I think the reality is like, you know, that's never going to happen with hundred percent of your investments. Um, and um, many companies, I would say probably most companies need to have, uh, make adjustments along the way, whether those adjustments are big enough to be called pivots or not is sort of, you know, pr probably not um, that doesn't matter that much, but I think, you know, th there, there are times when I think you need to uh, pivot, you know, and um and where it's the right thing to do. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the only other thing I would say is, and, 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 and where it's in everybody's interest and the investor's interest for the company to pivot and, um, and, and, you know, and that's okay. And that's fine. I think that's accepted. And, uh, you know, it's part of, it's part of the, it's part of the, the, the sort of, um, it's part of what we all sign up to when, for when we, when we decide to be entrepreneurs or investors. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think that's kind of how it, how it works. I like, um, Andy, your notion that the advisor is there to, as a stable force to ask questions and, and offer that. And I think that um, I certainly agree with Jeff that this is the, the investors are there hoping that everything is already perfect and they can just come up, come in, throw some money and some resources at you and everything will ride off into the sunset. When, when you as entrepreneurs are thinking through your problems, you're getting feedback and data from your investors, from your advisors, from your customers, from your whole supply chain. Um, were there any, com can you think of any times where the communication to those groups was part of the challenge or were, was the, the forward momentum of what you were doing and the new conversations was just carrying the pivot forward. I'm not sure if I've worded that question well enough, but what, one of the things we see with pivots, with change, is you have to communicate it to the people around you and to the other stakeholders in your firm, investors, advisors, customers. Was that a, a challenge for you? Was that something that actually supported your pivots, your changes? It's, my, mine was kind of simple because I didn't have investors, advisors. I had one partner and we were in on this together trying to figure out a way to survive. And um, eventually we figured out a way to thrive, but it was through, you know, it was not easy. And even when you're experiencing this exponential growth and things, to be, things seem to be easy and the wind is at your back and your business is exploding, it is still an incredibly difficult process. Um, it's hard work and it's not easy. It's fun, it can be very fun, but it is 
you know, there's a lot of stress. And we were feeling that as the business was growing, all of a sudden, kind of we were starting to feel a bit of the weight of the world on our shoulders because we we had a very small operation from a from a headcount standpoint and the business was exploding. And we all of a sudden we had a lot of constituents that we that were counting on us for this. So it was a difficult time, but beyond fun and I'd do it all over again if I had a chance. And Jeff, communicating with your, you had many more partners and investors to communicate with. Yeah, we, we had investors, we had um, employees, we had customers. Um, I think that um, I think that by far the most important constituent to listen to is your customers, right? You're, you're, ultimately, your customers are the lifeblood of the business. Everything that you do should be totally focused on your customer and what the customer wants. Um, it doesn't really matter what your investors want or what your employees want. I mean, I would say first customers, second employees, third would be investors, right? Like your investors don't run the company. You as the CEO founder run the company. And so you need to make those calls and, and you, you should be telling your investors what you're doing, not asking your investors for permission to do what you're going to do. You can get their advice and their input as you're trying to synthesize information. And that's great. And if you have investors that you respect and um, want to um, and can learn from, that's, gr that's great to get their input. But ultimately, you know, the founders, the, the senior team have to make decisions, uh, the final decision on these things. And um and, and, and you should be talking to your customers to decide what to do and looking at your customer adoption and what you said earlier, your product market fit, which ultimately is about customers buying the product that you're selling. Um, and if that, and if you're, if you've got a good product market fit and something the customers want, that's all that really matters. And if it's not there, then you probably need to pivot. We did have, we, we had some challenges like pivoting from Spreecast because we had a bunch of customers that were actually using it and liking it and paying for it at, at the time that we started charging for it. And we had to be, we had to first tell them, I mean, first we had to like, we didn't tell them anything, but we weren't really doing a lot of new features on it, which they would they would they would have a list of things they wanted. And we used to ship new products all the time. And then we stopped shipping new features there. So they were like, why is this taking so long? And we're like, oh, well, you know, you know, we were just kind of like trying to bury the kind of bone kind of thing. But then we had to tell them, actually, we're shutting this thing down in 30 days. You can download all your video files, but it's going away. Um, and then that, you know, that communication is always not well necessarily well received. So um, Focus on the communication with the customers, but realize sometimes even that conversation is not going to go so well. Right. But I mean, yeah. we, the, the issue was that we didn't have enough customers, right? Like, yeah. it, you know, we, it doesn't, my point about focusing on the customer doesn't mean that you, you always do what the customer wants, even if there's only four customers and you're losing money on every transaction. It just means like the customers and are there enough of them and what do they want? Th those are the questions that you should be asking, not what do your investors want? Absolutely. I want to thank you both. Um, I'm going to, I, I see we, we've run over a bit, but thank you both so much. I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Lori to, to kind of close us out. Thanks, Jax. Thank you, Jeff and Andy. What a fantastic session. Uh, Jax, I think your framing of myth busting around pivoting was such a fantastic one to use. And, and uh, both Andy and Jeff were able to give us the color commentary to help us understand that. And I think that notion of the basketball player being able to stay on one foot while pivoting, it's not all that abrupt. Uh, while it is abrupt and directed, you keep one foot on the ground you don't change everything, but also a basketball player can pivot back to where they started. Entrepreneurs need to experiment. Basketball player can call a timeout, and that we talked a lot about that as well. So thank you to all three of you for such an informative session. I also want to give some special thanks to our partners from Lifelong Learning, Amy Nichols, who's the director of Lifelong Learning, and Jillian Bieber, the associate director. Also, our San Francisco Venture Lab team, uh, Irina Yen, who's the director, Allison Grant, who directs events, Sarah Rodriguez, and Ali Kranzler. So thanks to everyone for joining us at today's Scale School program to change, pivot, or persist. And we'll see you again next time.